more chemical engineer oriented than I am would probably be able to tell you that that's bad. Um, <laughs> simplest terms. But the ability for them to detonate these bombs near the bromine tanks would have killed thousands in a matter of 60 minutes. Um, the poisonous gases released would have been devastating to the local transportation infrastructure in the port, as well as all the connected infrastructure in the area, whether it be the ability to run power or elsewise. Um, however, fortunately, the, there was enough security checkpoints in place that when the young men exited the container, um, they were still able to detonate and kill ten and wound hundreds of others, but they were able they were able to be contained to certain areas of the port. Now, many of us know that here in Port Newark. There's many of ga gas tanks, gas storages, li flammable liquids throughout the entire port. So the ability for this to happen here without correct security checkpoints is very possible. The other, the other recommendation that we'll discuss a little further later would be the fact that there are cu currently initiatives to screen 100% of the incoming cargo, whether it be containerized or elsewise, coming into the United States. Without this ability and the, the ability to keep our personnel up to this technology, we, we can see ourselves allowing this exposure to get through. Okay. Second event I'd like to discuss is the cargo plane bomb plot that happened this past October. Um, first of all, we had print ink cartridges are found with explosives inside of them that are luckily stopped in the United Kingdom and Dubai causes planes to be searched here in Newark and Philadelphia, all from a Yemen-based origin. Um, what does this mean to us? Well, the use of this was through UPS and FedEx carriers um, that came through as first, our first-tier parcel carriers, and I'm sure as many of you know in this room have all used a parcel carrier. Now put that on the corporate level, and how many packages and everything that are moving and the convenience of tracking that package has become in our current time. It's believed that these gentlemen in the uh, Al-Qaeda of the Arab Arabian Peninsula have been doing dry runs, sending uh, religious literature to synagogues in Chicago and the Midwest, um, basically for the point of tracking these, these explosives to see when, when we do send the actual explosive, when, when should we set it to detonate. So, as technology is increasing, you know, for our benefit as far as screening, technology is also benefiting the private sector as being able to track packages, know where everything is, but it comes back to that efficiency point. How do we become efficient where we know where our product is at any given time, any given, any given time in place, without impacting the security measures needed to protect the infrastructure around it? The second side I'd like to talk to you about is managed transit security. For our definitions here, we'll discuss air travel as well um, and the airport facilities. The challenges are not very unsimilar to the, to the supply chain. Um, you, once again, you have all of us in here have used some type of public transportation or have flown at some point in their lives. If you haven't, very good. <laughs> Impossible. <laughs> um, once again, you have limited resources. I think I was discussing with uh, Robert yesterday about um, getting $70 million for a $100 million job when you're working on transit. Yeah. Uh, how, how, do you, how do you stretch and expand the security needs with the limited amount of capital and personnel that you have? And also, the other part to have, that you have to look at is the underdeveloped education of the ordinary user. How many people get on the subway every day and think about every single possibility of you know, vulnerability they have open to them in regards to attack. As far as supply chain users, yeah, there's plenty of education of that. There's regulating bodies constantly looking over large corporations. But on the mass transit side, there is a lot less presence there. So once again, we took two case studies and uh, demonstrated their potential to occur here. First would be the Domo de Dovo International Airport bombing happened this past January. Um, two Chechnyan um, bombers, once again, suicide bombers, with, with bombing apparatuses connected, go into the international arrivals area of the airport, detonate. This marks the second time in 12 months to the incident. 
that the metro system of Moscow has been attacked. And once again, the process for fixing, fixing the uh, attack has been by attacking Chechen uh, groups, going after those who are responsible, which is definitely, definitely a uh, suitable response. However, the process that allowed it to occur was where the error was. I was fortunate enough to get to speak to um, a colleague of mine at my company who works in the Moscow office, and he, uh, I, I said to him, you know, I'm doing this project. What, what was your take as someone that uses the airport frequently? He told me that um, in some ways the attack woke up security because they finally put the metal detectors back in. So here are some small details that we as Americans in major airports are looking at. Of course, you have to go through a checkpoint, you have to go through TSA, you have to get in that way. There was areas of this airport where these, unfortunately, these bombers were able to get in and impact and kill hundreds. Uh, kill, excuse me, injure hundreds. And I actually have a video show. Oh. Well, let me show the video. Well, that was going to be a video there. And, uh, so, going back to that real quick is Domo de Dovo, what does that show us here in the United States? Complacency and security can lead to extreme exposures. So being able to continuously improve our security procedures, whether it be through the public sector and transportation security administration and customs, or whether it be through private sector initiatives by fostering technology to stop these events from occurring, both of these have to be examined further. Fourth event I'd like to discuss is the London Underground bombings in 2005. Now, why choose this event? It's here we are in the northeast of the United States, New York metro system, Boston T system, some of the biggest metro systems in the north and the eastern coast of the United States, with, as we've discussed, limited capital to, to protect. You can put in surveillance systems, you can put in personnel to protect, but those resources are always going to be contained. So it's, it's important as, as professionals in the industry to realize that these events can occur and it is our responsibility as, as travelers on the system and as, as local enterprises to, to can cooperate and to impart on that. Um, so these are our four case studies. What can we do to prevent this in the United States? Some of this we've discussed. When it comes to the supply chain, programs and initiatives expansion, what does that deal with? Well, we're already on the right track. We do have programs in place that we're, we're, we need to step on. First, I'd like to discuss is Customs Trade Partnership Against Terrorism, CTPAT. This is an excellent program that I recommend personally to all my clients, as, as uh, shippers, you know, to ensure that their carriers and their consignees um, understand the, the risks and exposures during their supply chain. How can we expand them? Well, it's honestly difficult to tell someone to front load security without, without giving them a financial incentive. Throughout, through my research, I have found that Customs has proposed to Congress in the past and needs to be revisited is, is increased financial incentives for these companies. Now, by Giving financial incentives to, to large shippers in the United States and, and in, ensuring that they're implementing these same procedures on their suppliers, you will expand the CTPAT community. And by expanding the community, you can get more industry specific and all of our infrastructure communities, whether it be power, whether it be transportation, can be further defined and further analyzed. Um, beyond that, we have to foster uh, screening technology. We do have programs in place where we're, we're, we're limiting the liability, such as the Safety Act, of these programs, but in, in order to get private sector to give in these resources. But we need to further incentivize those projects as well, because without, without being able to take these limited, without being able to pull in these masses, mass amounts of resources, we're left with very little we can do. In regards to mass transit, 
Transportation Security Administration has been under some scrutiny as of late. Now, a lot of that is, you know, media interplay, but what can we, what can we look at with that? We have to look at the advancement in technology that's occurring right now. We do have, we do have these private industries and these new scanners and all this stuff coming in, but we're missing the ability to, to train all of our personnel to that level. So by redefining the training processes within our public authorities and get the assistance of the private sector, um, we're, we're looking at looking at a difficult challenge ahead of us by upping the upping the training and abilities of the TSA. The other part I would like to mention is the uh, carrier liability. We've got these parcel carriers that you know have COGSA, um, cargo of goods at SEAC that limit their liability to very small numbers. It's one thing that the private sector has to continue to look at is, is the carrier doing their position because Yes, they may be CT pack. They may have these things in place, and that's excellent. But how are they getting audited? How are they auditing their suppliers? So pushing that onto the private carriers to implement that and to ensure that these things are going on is crucial to, to raising the entire level of security. Um, that point. Any questions? Okay, we'll we'll uh, we'll 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 hold off the questions, and we have a panel.